today we are with the Honorable Jean Augustine. And this is actually a really, really special moment for all of us because you've been such a massive, massive advocate for social change. You've been involved in politics and you've made literal Canadian history multiple times. And you're a huge reason why Black History Month is a reality here in Canada. So thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. Well, thank you so much, Deepa. I'm really very happy to do so. Of course. And, you know, I feel like you have a very, very interesting story full of passion and uh, motivation. So I kind of wanted to get into that. So tell us about your story. I know originally you're from Grenada. So what was life back home like? And, you know, when you came to Canada, was that the ultimate goal for you? <laughs> I was born in Happy Hill, St. George's, Grenada. And uh, Grenada is known as the Isle of Spice. All of the spices you can think about, whether it's a nutmeg or the cinnamon or the cloves or the ginger, whatever, it's grown in Grenada. It's an organic island. I was born in a very good year, 1937. And uh, you know what was happening in Europe with the wars and the whatever else. So life was, um, was tough. Mm -hmm. um, families didn't have a lot in terms of monies, but we had land and we had things growing on the land so that um, one could um, share with one's neighbors. Leaving high school, there weren't a lot of opportunities for young women mm -hmm. um, or for young people in general. The job situation was not really... Um, and I think in every country, the young always seem to be the ones that suffer the whole issue of unemployment. And so there was a specific scheme that Canada had called the Caribbean, the Canada Caribbean Domestic Scheme. The, the uh, Caribbean um, countries were asked to send X number of young women to Canada Mm. Uh, on that scheme to work in the home of a Canadian family, then they would get landed immigrant status. Mm -hmm. So I took that opportunity. I was a, what was called a pupil teacher at the time. And so I came armed and ready to, <laughs> to make a difference <laughs> uh, to Canada to get post-secondary education because on the island there was nothing post-secondary uh, at the time. Mm. And uh, the University College of the West Indies had just started really to crank up and to, you know, to take um, young people from different parts of the Caribbean. In the 1960s, when you first came to Canada, was there like a large population of West Indian and Caribbean people living here? Um, and also, what was the atmosphere like? Was there a lot of racial tension or were West Indians uh, welcomed with open arms to Canada? Well, there weren't a lot coming at the 1960. There weren't a lot. Because if you, you go back, you'll talk about the immigration policies mm -hmm. that did not kind of permit um, you know, people of African descent, Black people from the Caribbean, from parts of Africa, etc. Mm -hmm. And so it was just almost the beginning of, um, of immigration uh, from the Caribbean. So there weren't a lot of Black um, folks. Actually, when you walk the street, when I walk the streets of um, Toronto, and you saw another Black person, you said hello. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and you inquire about um, services that you couldn't find, you know, where is the closest, where did you find the hairdresser, where was the hairdresser. There were a number of Indigenous people who were here for, uh, for um, generations, a lot of people from Atlanta. We started to, you know, to find each other and to find and to make communities. And uh, I said this earlier, and maybe some of your listeners may, may have um, heard me, um, at some point in time. Toronto in the 60s, when I first came, it was a different place than it is today. We had no charter of rights and freedom. And I'm speaking particularly about section 15 that says you can't discriminate on the basis of. Right. We didn't have that. That didn't come until we repatriated our constitution and we amended it with the charter. We had no human rights code as we know it today. So that if you wanted to complain about discrimination, you can go there and they will, it was not like that um, in the 60s. Um, we had no Landlord and Tenant Act uh, and legislation so that the landlord could say it's for sale, but it's for, it's for rent, but not to you. Mm -hmm. um, we had several uh, 
things that were missing in the society, communication between the community and the police, um, the school boards and, um, and uh, educators, the school boards and parents, et cetera. So there were lots and lots that needed uh, to be done if we were to say, talk about a just society, mm -hmm. a diverse society. We had started to look at the society um, whether it, and uh, to some, you know, it came up, um, who are we? Are we just English and French? And then we came up with the notion by 1971 mm -hmm. that we were a multicultural, multiracial, multiethnic, multireligious society. And so putting all of that together, it was ripe for activism to, to, to push governments, to push legislators, because as I usually, as I say, um, legislators don't say, okay, now what can we do for, you know, uh, for that community? So we had to push for representation, mm -hmm. you know, where you are right now in, in radio and in television. And then, I mean, the voices were not there and they gave excuses like accent, you know, you had to get some training to get the right accent, wow. the right, you know, in order to get a, you know, to get a job in, in radio. And uh, the faces on the television, reading the news, so we had, uh, there were just those faces on there. So we had to push for those things. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this is where I worked with others. There were lots of people on the front line who were, um, who were leaders in the community, who felt that sense of um, unfairness in the society, just wanted to see equality, wanted things for our children in the school system. And with all of that, the activism. And so there I was, I, I, not that I was caught up, but I, I had to put myself into this mm -hmm. because I too wanted a society that was fair and just and equal. You you just touched upon this, but like in 1971, you were called upon to help develop uh, and launch Canada's official multiculturalism policy. Yes. So what was your role in developing that policy? And I know you just mentioned that, um, you know, you had a lot of frontline workers who were supportive of representation and multiculturalism, but on the flip side, did you guys receive some pushback to passing the multiculturalism policy? Well, there were, it was not just the black community, the Ukrainian community out from out west, there's a national Ukrainian um, organization, a lot of people provided leadership and a lot of the European people. Um, those people who were also wanting their place in the society, wanting to ensure that their communities were recognized. Um, so the black community was part of that endeavor too, mm -hmm. wanting to ensure this nature of Canadian society. At the same time, uh, many of us, uh, myself included, were doing things like writing curricular modules because we didn't see anything mm -hmm. about ourselves in the history books, in the social studies programs. Um, and, uh, and also earlier, there was a lot of consultation taking place. So there were committees, people were put on committees that went across the country to talk to various communities. And um, many of us got in, in, engaged and involved in that. And um, I was called um, by uh, former prime minister, um, Pierre Lea Trudeau and said, I want you to um, I want you to work with um, work on the education multiculturalism and education policy. Mm -hmm. And so I worked with many people in his department, and they cloistered a professor Tony Johnson, God rest in peace, he's passed on, and myself and um, a couple other people. And we sat, they said, they put us in a place called Natawasaga, where there was an inn. And they say, you stay there until that multiculturalism and education <laughs> piece is written. And I think we spent, uh, we spent quite a few days um, from about Thursday to Tuesday or something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, got on the history and Tony Johnson, Professor Johnson was, um, was a professor with a lot of skills and 
and, uh, and talent and whatnot. And I added my two pennies <laughs> uh, to that. So I think the multicultural and the education piece um, that I had some, you know, some, um, some hand in that. Oh, for, for sure. <laughs> and that's literally like writing history for Canada because that was yeah. such a big deal. And, you know, aside from that, I like want to brag about some of the stuff you've done because I find it incredibly cool. So you served on multiple boards, like you were on the board of York University, Hospital for Sick Children, Stephen Lewis Foundation as well. So I don't know, like what drove you to be such an active member of society? Because a lot of times people see problems, but they're like, eh. <laughs> like they don't do anything to help that situation. So what pushed you to do all of these different things? And was it like personal experiences back home in Grenada? Was it your experience here in Canada? Well, I think I grew up in an environment where service was the bottom line. We participated in community things. Mm -hmm. We participated in the church. After the service on a Sunday, uh, the priest would come by, you know, for... Um, for whatever we had as breakfast. Um, we helped out uh, in the church. Um, when I was at the convent um, as um, in high school, I participated in, in various uh, groups. And so it was important for me to, to participate, to not let others do it. And there was an old saying, if it's to be, it's up to me. <laughs> if you want to see something happen, you have to get there and you have to participate. You have to put your hand in and you have to do it. And so when I came to Toronto, I saw all these gaps, just as we see in gaps now mm -hmm. in, our, in our society. And, um, and then you look around to see who's doing what, who can I work with, how can I help, how can I participate, what can I do to make it better? And somehow it's almost like a gene uh, that I have that says, hey, get up, do it, get <laughs> up, <laughs> be part of this. 1993, you made history again as the first African-Canadian woman to be elected to Canada's House of Commons as a member of parliament from the GTA constituency of Etobicoke Lakeshore. So what was your reaction to becoming the first African-Canadian woman to achieve this? Actually, during the time I was running, it did not strike me that I was the first African Canadian woman mm -hmm. running. I knew that I didn't have a lot of mentors. I didn't have any kind of role model. I didn't have someone I can look to and say this was how she did it. Uh, but I didn't know anybody who went into the House of Commons as, Commons as a woman. Mm -hmm. I knew of the two men, Lincoln Alexander and Howard McCurdy, but they were gone by, 19, uh, by 1993. So I walked in there with a sense of awe. Oh, I had leadership skills. I had managed big schools. I had managed Metro Toronto Housing Authority and you know, provided leadership there. I had been engaged, as you, you, know, you noted, on several boards. So I brought with me some experience. And as a friend of mine would say, some heft. <laughs> uh, but at the same time, I had no uh, political experience, because although I was very helpful to candidates, I used to uh, knock at doors or put brochures in people's boxes, et cetera, et cetera. I had never run myself and I had no, um, I had no knowledge about, you know, the parliamentary, uh, what was expected in that setting. Mm -hmm. And of course I got there and uh, Within uh, the first um, tranche of nominations, I was made parliamentary secretary to the prime minister. Wow. So here I went in and then I was right up with the prime minister. So I was learning and had to learn very fast. And at the same time, there was a sense of awe and oh my gosh, and look at where I am. Mm -hmm. No one has thrown breadcrumbs so I can follow. Um, and so I was, making my own path mm -hmm. and trying to do as much as I possibly can. I did not go in with the intention that I want to be a minister, I want to be anything. I was looking for gaps in the system, what I can do, what it was possible as the member of parliament for Etobicoke Lakeshore to do to create some change. 
you didn't necessarily have any like breadcrumbs to follow. But if you think about it now, like you've done so much groundwork for a lot of women who look up to you and, you know, they have somebody who they can say, yes, like this person achieved so much, not only because they wanted to achieve stuff, but because it meant a lot to them. And you actually played a pivotal, pivotal role in securing um, legislative support to pass this motion you know designating february as black history month so take us back to the beginning of that like how did that idea come about and um what were some of the biggest challenges that you had to face to get this approved the idea came about as a result of the fact that uh, black history month was celebrated in the united states since 1926 uh carter g woodson was supposed to be the founder of black history month and um the men around Toronto who worked on the railway, in the railway cars, going back and forth to the United States would bring back information about that celebration. Mm -hmm. And of course, the news media were always carrying stuff about um, what was going on in the United States. And so the Negro Women's Association and a couple of the churches and followed by the push, um, by the Ontario Black History Society to have the city declare February, um, um, proclaim, do a proclamation that February is Black History Month in the city of Toronto. And then they asked that the federal government make a proclamation and was told that, you know, the federal government does not make proclamation, uh, you know, of the sort. And so I started to uh, begin to think how important that was, that we needed to do something officially. I was thinking at my, my days in the classroom when there was nothing in the books and when I used to, to read and find things and have it up on my chalkboard and yet concerned that maybe a supervisory officer might say, no, Mrs. Augustine, where did you get that information? Mm -hmm. And is that the right information for the right level, you know, the right module for the right... Uh, and so I felt that if we can get something done officially, then I'll make sure that that happened. And so I started to, um, to get um, advice as to what could be done. And I was told a private member's bill or uh, a motion. Mm -hmm. Private member's bill goes on the table and um, you have to wait to see whether it will be picked because it's kind of like a lottery for private members, business to come forward. And I said, you know, I remember jokingly saying to them, I buy lottery tickets all the time <laughs> <laughs> and I never win. So the chance of my bill coming up um, at the same time, I was also told if you wanted a motion, but a motion had to be unanimous. Everybody in the house on that specific day, when you put the motion, must know what it is you're asking. Mm -hmm. And so this is why the motion, as you read it, goes right to the point. The house was not a very comfortable place at the time mm -hmm. to talk about social issues. We had the Reform Party, Preston Manning, and uh, at the time, not the Conservatives as they are today. And uh, the Bloc Québécois was in the house for the very first time in 93. And, um, the Conservative Party was down to two members, Elsie Wayne and um, just lost his name. Um, at the same time, um, I took the risk that I would talk to every single member to ensure that I get unanimous consent. My caucus was easy because I talked to my caucus at caucus meeting and let them know what the motion is, what the motion said, why I wanted the motion. And then I use my question period time to go sit beside the members of the Reform Party one by one by one and try to show them, I had copies, show them what the motion would say and ask if they're in the house when I stand up, I would like them to give unanimous consent. And so this was, it took months. It was just a few months to, you know, to reach everybody, to get everybody to get some uh, consent, um, to put it forward, to get the speaker and to get the house um, uh, timetable schedule that I get a time when I can get up to do this. Um, and, um, and the risk of 
someone, one person saying no, yeah. could have cascaded the whole thing. <laughs> Like you, you had to put so much groundwork into it. And there's always that, like, what if, like you said, one person can really change That's right. the, That's the right. outcome That's of right. that. But it's, it's so awesome that like now, yes. now we can celebrate open and freely. And like, we yes. get to have these open conversations about how it came to be. And another, another really cool thing that you did is you're the founder of the June Augustine Center for Young Women. So, you know, why in your personal opinion, is it so important to imply, to empower uh, black women? And what are some of the success stories that you have personally seen from the program? Well, I think it's, it's important that we roll, that we provide role models for young people. It's important that we start conversations with young people at a very early age. Mm -hmm. And so we take the girls at the center from age seven and I watch them come in, many of them, it's the 10, 11 year old, a little awkward, a little head down, a little shy, et cetera. And I watch them blossom mm -hmm. because it's a safe environment. We don't give marks for anything, right? And one can, one can excel, whether it's the STEM programs that they sign up for, whether it's a cooking class or the sewing class or the self-defense, or they just come for homework help, or they come so that they could um, begin in that safe place to, to learn about how you start a business and all these entrepreneurial and what in a very safe environment with caring people and also with, um, with uh, a way of, of operating with respect. So there is no bullying, no pushing, mm -hmm. giving way to others. Those who are older take responsibility for one who's younger. And we provide, um, you know, skills uh, for some of the older ones, how you help younger uh, people, how you read to them, what, you know, so we, 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 it's a wide, wide ranging set of programs that we have with caring people in a really great environment. My last question for you is, in your opinion, I feel like this is a tough question, uh, <laughs> what has been, in your opinion, your biggest contribution to Canada? Oh, I presented Canada with two citizens, two daughters, <laughs> two grandsons. <laughs> so I think that's a big contribution because, of course, <laughs> you know that um, there are population numbers we can always do with, um, with, with <laughs> on a serious note, um, I'm very proud of my children and my grandchildren. At the same time, um, I'm proud of the opportunities that Canadian and uh, systems have offered me, the good people in Canada, those who have um, supported the various and varying things that I've done and uh, the awards I've received, the kudos that I get from organizations. I am very, very proud and pleased uh, that uh, for the recognition because I think it's only in a country like Canada with the policies that we have that a young girl can come from Happy Hill, St. Mm -hmm. George's Grenada, from poor environment and reach the highest place in the land with all the accolades that a country can give to an individual. Wow, I'm like, I'm just in awe that first of all, we had the chance to have this conversation. So thank you so, so much for your time. Thank you for everything that you have done for Canada because the list is a very long <laughs> list. 